Right, we don't, we've got about 20, 25 minutes to do some group conversation, experience sharing. Um, we did have an exercise that we were going to go through, but I don't think we've got quite enough time to do that. Um, so what I suggest is perhaps as, as groups in the tables, you, you, you throw out some ideas in terms of what are the key areas that you think are important in pushing forward in kind of building data literacy or increasing the usage of data. Um, between us, we'd, we'd identified some key areas there in terms of developing partnerships, working on um, how do you change culture and behavior in terms of usage of data in advocacy, um, looking at capacities, um, the issue of peer review and quality assurance. How do you ensure that the quality of analysis of data is such that you can actually make claims of accountability? Um, perceived value of different data. Um, I think we've seen in some of the Publish What You Pay work that um, there were assumptions about the perceived value of mandatory disclosure data by certain coalitions. Um, what other issues are, are there in relation to that? And also learning. How do you support um, people to learn to use data? How do you support people to learn to use data effectively and kind of push this on? Um, so in groups, what I'd like to do is have a have a leader on the table who will facilitate the table. Yes? Self-organizing. Self um, so as tables, if you could select a key area you think is important, have a conversation about it. If we do that for about 20 minutes, we can then come back to plenary and share our, our three key takeaways from our group discussion. Yeah? Brilliant. And we'll kind of circulate around. To yeah. Okay, we'll check in later. I'm not going to lie, I have a lot of thoughts on this. <laughs> you can. I run something called School of Data. I run, uh, I don't think I can run it. Yeah. Writing. <laughs> In poop writing. I don't know. I, I yes. like started typing when I was yeah. like six, so I never had to like problems. Yeah, I had to make it up. I used to have brush on my own side. And I love this book, Stop. Oh, the places that can say, don't be scared, take this information. Here's some nice tools and products and things in a human language that you understand. It doesn't make me scared. Don't talk too much about tech and data. Don't use the D word. <laughs> don't do Please never use data science when what you mean is Excel. Yeah. yeah. yeah no, so it's taking no, no. that scare in yourself of it and making people who don't feel they can even be embarrassed to ask questions because they think it's a too basic question. To do. Yeah. Just, just how do you make bridging that that divide? I think people seem very cool and techy. People just have a basic question about something they want to be answered. So it's bringing it right down to kind of what's the point to solve and how can data work. Demystify what it, like yeah, what it is to do data yeah. work. And I think we all fall into that. I think even these computers like this, that's a big point to that trouble. It's pretty cool and techy, and actually, that's what's going on. Themselves because they've gone to these kind of things and they think they need to learn R. Excel is getting busy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm like going to write a blog post for you that's Excel. Why you should stop talking to me about your days on file? Because we have thousands of roles, let's get it. It's fine. And like meeting people where they are, like not trying to be like, oh, you don't want this new tool. But if you do your, your school of data sessions and you've got you know, great training on the day and they, they leave the room all enthused on that day, where do they go a few weeks later when they finally get around to doing that one thing on a Friday afternoon? Because they they've gone back to their day job. How do you keep that fresh and exciting? For me, little tools like video clips, do you remember what a new lookup was? Do you remember what you know, people talked about these different formats? Is there something about friendly, really usable toolkits 
And then people they can speak to, humans they can speak to, so I think they try to ask us a big part of that. So the way we are like starting to structure it, and like we've been thinking about this a lot, because I, we get approached by civil society all the time, and they're like, can you teach us to be data scientists? You have three days. I'm like, great. Yeah. No. Six months later, I'll <laughs> into that. Yeah. So like the, oh, no, a thing that we recently did is, so Transparency International, the Secretariat had some money to train their um, chapters, or their member, whatever they call them. Chapters. Chapters. And um, it was their Europe, this one was specifically their European chapters. So I think like eight of their chapters signed up. And we said, like, we're making, you have to send two people. Yeah. Because we, like, people move yeah. on. It's like, it's really to get, start yeah. to get them to think about teams, yeah. like data teams, as opposed to, like, individuals within an organization that do the data thing. So they had to send two people. Uh, we did, like, a survey beforehand. I was, like, the whole plan was to do a really basic training, but the people that the European chapters were sending were doing some decently advanced data work within their individual chapters, so we did do some R and stuff like that. We did, like, a one-week, very intensive training, but the idea was to push them outside their comfort zone. A week. Yeah, so it was five five days. That's I, a luxury. It was a luxury. Like, I mean, it took me nine months to negotiate this, <laughs> and it was a tiny, tiny contract. And then we added to it, um, by the end, they had to, with their chapter, come up with a project that they were going to be working on. And then following that, we had we built in like a mentorship thing. Yeah. So the two trainers that we had were available four hours a week for the different chapters to help them work through. So, you've got so they go back to their office and they're actually working on a data project. So time and availability and follow up are big yeah, I mean, parts of that, I think. Yeah, definitely. And getting a whole team involved. I'm also from School of Data, but the German chapter. And um, what we do, we actually take quite, well, quite more time, so we don't do three-day training or so stuff like that, because, I mean, you can do it, but it does not really have any impact um, on the long run, so we also cooperate with a um, civil society organization over three or four months, yeah. and then we try to get them really engaged in their topics, so we try to identify what kind of data they have, and then they get really excited about working actually on, on the topics and on the data they, they already collected, yeah. and they try to better understand that. And, um, yeah, then we kind of um, try to give them small tasks like cleaning data and so on. So we try to identify also um, very specific topics where they want to improve certain skills. And then they contribute to an overall project. So they, at the end, they kind of own a project and they can build up um, on top of that and also do advocacy work within governments and so on. So this is how we uh, kind of approach that. And do you um, promote, when you've done that, your training, all that hard work and all enthused afterwards, do you, do you promote them having a designated contact point within the organisation to take that work? Forward? Yeah, definitely. We work with the entire team. So we try to get the management on board, the CEOs, and um, the team that, that is actually yeah. doing the everyday work. Yeah. So, and we found out that this is like the best mixture because you have the support from the top, you have the enthusiasm from the bottom, and well, that's what best I, I often find that meeting people. in the middle doesn't always. If you don't have that, for me, a kind of key question is: Do you have a digital strategy as an organisation? The answer is no. You know, you don't really have that senior understanding of buy-in because otherwise, yeah. it's quite bottom-up. It's often like a very keen person who tries to push this stuff through. And I think if you don't have a CEO or a senior manager who understands how it fits, because it does depends on the size of your yeah. as well. Yeah. 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 It depends on yeah. the size of it. I don't know how it's going you would kind of map across where they're at before you start the work. Mm, yeah, definitely. But just to add, because I think it's sometimes, I mean, um, from, from the experience that we uh, did in Germany, was that many NGOs, they just really don't know where to start. They no. don't know data literacy, they don't, you know, you have no. to kind of open the door. So that's not really about it, it's kind of a basic so, mapping that you do. Process or not have the electricity supply cut up in the process or whatever. Yeah.
And the thing about, um, like you were saying, the burden being on the community to be literate is, like, in a way, sure, we have to understand what you're giving us, but also can you just write it in a way that's clear and that yeah. it's translatable for everyone? The whole point is that anybody should be able to tap in and be like, I know exactly what this means. But, you know, if they give you data and, like, yeah, and it's, it, the responsibility actually is on the people that are providing, because if it's kind of, it's worth everything that they have data standards and they can be like, this is what we expect, you know, when we ask for open data, like it's exactly what it is. Um, and if they don't meet that standard, it's not our it's not our fault that we can't read it and we don't understand what's going on. But I think within again, once we have the information, it's that translation to make it useful. So that there's so much, <laughs> so much to do. And then yeah, at the end of it, you're like, maybe that will get rid of corruption. Like that is for our purposes. We're like at the very end of the whole. Yeah, it's a part of it that you can't, you don't know if it, if it makes a difference. You know, we can we spend so much time that in a couple of cases we've like demanded data, demanded information, and got it, and then like, oh, that wasn't actually what we were supposed to be. And we spent too long asking for it, and then like, oh, actually, it was not what we were supposed to be. Yeah. And you know, that's what's surprising things like that, that's where they're coming into this whole effort from. But I do think it's like more, more opportunities like this for a range of people coming out from different perspectives to discuss it. It's really helpful to sit on from where I come at it from. Usually data isn't the problem. And the data is necessary, but it's way insufficient. And it's not actually the hardest thing to get people to do to get their data. Right. People are not daft, they just don't do that every day as part of their normal life. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, if what you really need to make this happen is engagement by people who've got some kind of legitimate right to have government be accountable to them, then you've got to avoid alienating them by making it seem as if the shortcoming is theirs. Yeah. And you've got to treat them as knowledgeable yeah. subjects. They're the ones who both best understand you know, how local governance corruption works in their, in their area. Or in, so all of those things need to be kind of valued in the process. And their understanding of, for example, the risks that they might be pushed to themselves that they start making the same kind of data about. Which is not slightly stupid. I do think data is really vitally important part of it. Yeah, I keep thinking about some like like Dayscope.uk where we haven't ever been able to find a user. Like we've never been able to say, as a user, I need this. Because there's nothing so generalizable as that. You have, yeah. to, you have to see it as a sort of we just need the data there and we'll work out, you know, it, it has a it has a role in another another user journey later on. But what, what does DataGov do to try to find out? They've been doing workshops for like the last three years. They just they keep trying to talk to people about um, and why do you need the data? It's like, it's just, like, I just might, or I'm I'm sort of fine that it's there. Like they haven't been able to find somebody outside. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah but that might I mean the phrasing of that as well. Let's have five minutes. Why? Yeah. 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 I paraphrase. Do you, yeah. do you want data on who supplies the electricity to the street lamps in your street? No, I'm too busy. You. But, but, but there's a different way of framing that about like people's real life. I, I yeah. mean, I don't know how it's really. They, they have people who are much more tactful than me. Yeah. <laughs> Why is our data? Why we should? Why should we opening up our data to our private sector? So I think uh, uh, people and uh, governments didn't know about the important of the opening data. So did you uh, have a experience for training to government? I think that is a lot of information right now. Most people are not really using the gastro advocacy and transparency. So we realize that we have the local authority budgets. We 
with the national budgets. We also have the financial statements for the various mining companies. We also have um, the audited financial statements. So those are some of the documents. Which, um, are you ready to Clap once. If you can hear me, clap two times. If you can hear me, clap three times. Make, make the question, please, okay? Sure. Thank you, Joyce. So, Joyce, could you tell us about your key takeaways your group talked about for data literacy and data use? Okay, so one thing that we were mainly discussing and also that came out was the issue to do with, um, you know, when um, Duncan presented that at times, you know, government is not really open or maybe uh, responsive with regards to whatever that the citizens, communities would have uh, asked with regards to what they would have assessed or analyzed. So uh, it also came up that, uh, you know, when also we are doing such kind of work, it's not only that we need to deal with the demand side, like building the capacity of the communities or civil society to demand whatever change they want to see, but it is also important that we also work with the supply side, like building the capacity or training also government departments. It might also be legislators, like the members of parliament, the various uh, government departments have just been giving examples of um, the kind of um, stakeholders we work with in Zimbabwe. Like we have the environmental management agency, we have the parliamentarians. So it takes both sides for them also to understand like the raw district councils they know they're supposed to do um, consultations and budgeting, but at times they don't. But also just to try and make them understand the importance of such kind of processes. So we both deal with the demand and the supply side. That would also make impact. So that also we don't get the communities frustrated when they are asking for information or uh, demanding for transparency and asking them to be accountable for various processes so that it's also a two-way process. So those are some of the things we've been discussing. Thank you so much. Um, so we didn't have a like, super organized discussion, but, uh, <laughs> but I think uh, one thing that really struck us from the, from the presentations, and that goes a little bit beyond the question you asked, was uh, the sort of the very strong and very encouraging developments around uh, around uh, MEL and monitoring and on learning indicators for open contracting. Uh, so particularly things around like w both savings, perception, perceptions of trust, like there's really now a, a strong set of indicators that I think other sectors could really benefit from. Um, so we discussed that a bit. Uh, it's also striking I think, from across the presentations how uh, how much we keep coming back to understanding the contextuality of data needs and data demands. Uh, we can get national or global disclosures, but very often there's a community or even a local context that means that we need additional data. And I think building that into programs, I think that's, that's another, another strike. I don't know if anyone wants to add. All right. Okay. Oh, one quick comment. Yes. So I just wanted to quickly add that in youth, in youth partnerships, um, we should be we should take into uh, recognition the importance of having building the capacity of the media as well, because we build these great tools, we do the advocacy, but they can tell the stories in a way that we can't, and they can also reach a, a, a wider audience. So the, the role of the media is very important. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm Shaheen, and I'm from the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change, surrounded by people who are much more data literate than I am, but the irony is that I'm giving the presentation. Um, so 
Um, I think okay, we didn't have a massively structured discussion, but some key things that came out were around the user experience. Um, so when agencies are trying to um, better understand what their different user groups are and then therefore understand what different presentations of data are actually useful to those user groups. Um, and actually it sounds like we can get in a twist about those types of things. So we had groups who are trying to present for media outlets and journalists versus groups who are trying to present for politicians versus donors. Um, and each group has a different need. Um, and then on top of that, understanding where the technology is going and so making sure that all that data is machine um, readable um, can paint quite a complex picture about where this is going. Um, I also think we had um, a discussion around um, cultural shifts. Um, so particularly when working with governments, um, we seem to be in a world where things are much more, um, I think, easier when you're in your institutional silos. Um, so we talked about great case studies in various institutions of data being um, a driver for government decision making. Um, or change or massive changes and massive savings in government, but that those case studies aren't necessarily then shared um, across different ministries. Um, the lessons aren't necessarily applied. Um, the data um, education isn't then implemented afterwards. So you might have um, different groups in government who are really good at um, publishing data, but also asking the so what and dealing with that question, um, but not necessarily across um, across whole governments. Um, and then from my own experience um, around data literacy, I think um, a lot of our work um, takes place in sub-Saharan Africa and for us, um, trying to explain how data is really going to be useful to people who work in different government departments um, and what it's necessarily going to unveil is a really difficult um, process, um, particularly when um, you, you don't have those case studies to hand um, and you can't feel the reality within, within your individual work stream. Um, so doing more of the sharing and the learning is a really big focus for us, but the first, you know, first point of call will be the data literacy. Oh, Anthony? We had a really good conversation here about data use and data usage and approaches to it and how good it is to see um, a, a strong focus on data use built into all of the examples that were talked about. Um, and we had three points that we wanted to share. The first one was um, to the, the sector in a way that the part of the transparency and accountability and openness field that's focused on natural resources and budget issues and issues to do with public, public revenue um, has been until now, until relatively recently, both supply driven, very supply side focused, and also very data centric. And we were discussing how that it's, it's contained a presumption that citizens want to engage and all they lack is the data. Um, and how that's a big problem when you start to see through the years of practice and failure that citizens are not engaging, you have to start asking big questions about that assumption. Um, a second point that we talked about related was that while data is clearly necessary, it's not at all sufficient. And we talked about, well, I was just really interested to hear in the presentations about how the approach was very much about understanding where people are at and why people are the key actors in making use of the data because they're the ones who've got the legitimate claim, in principle anyway, the legitimate claim on their government to get their government to use the resource revenue for what they're supposed to or for spending public funds on what they're meant to, or for sharing information about budget um, allocation and execution. So there, the data might be actually a relatively small part of the picture, and what's the bigger part of the picture is the community mobilization, the organizing, the uh, sort of the staying power to stick at it over years, among people who are probably by definition time poor, because they're probably relatively poor and marginalized within their own society, if they're, if they're needing to do this because they probably do have certain limitations like that. Um, and then we moved on to talking about data literacy um, and recognised that the concept of data literacy is tending to put the onus on the citizen, the, the, the expected user or hoped for user of uh, the data that's opened up, not on the provider. And just thinking that actually, so there has been lots of discussion about accessible data in the open data field. But the, the definition of accessibility tends to be around open data standards rather than around the kind of cultural and socio-economic conditions which actually define what makes data useful for people in rural Zimbabwe or for people in 
um, you know, foreign aid in suburban Ukraine. Um, so a big need to kind of shift the perspective on data literacy and think less about uh, open data standards and more about a kind of let's take more of an anthropological look at the realities of the people who would have to use this data if combined with a whole load of other strategies to do with mobilising, galvanising, organising, advocating, arguing, uh, doing public interest litigation or whatever, it might be able to have this good effect. Anybody want to add? <laughs> All right, last group. Um, okay, so we primarily focused on improving data literacy and talked a lot about improving data literacy in civil society organizations. Um, so one of the first things that we talked about, and I think that this community is really um, guilty of, is sometimes when we talk about tech and data, we use overly complex terms. So I talk to a lot of people who talk about data science when what they mean is making a pivot table in Excel. And that's great when you're trying to upsell like the sexiness of your work. It's a problem that exclu it excludes a lot of people. It makes this seem more complex than it actually is. Not that pivot table is the best term, but these things can be simpler and we can use simpler language and kind of meet people where they are and with the language that they already understand. Um, so that's kind of one of the things we talked about. Um, we talked about demystifying a little bit what it is to work with data that again, it doesn't have to be this overly complex, you need to be a computer programmer, and these kind of things that can be really simple things, really simple tools um, that everyone already knows how to do with kind of like basic knowledge of like math. Um, so again, it's kind of about meeting people where they are. We also talked about like the time and availability and the resources. Um, when we're working with civil society organizations, they have many, many priorities. Um, I get asked a lot to train people to become data scientists in a weekend, and I cannot do that. <laughs> um, so making sure people understand like what can be done in different time frames and where we can get, and really being intentional in how we use people's time and the skills that we are actually trying to build. Um, I, one of the things that we talked about a little bit was thinking about data, um, civil societies needing to think about data as a strategic function and not an operational function. Again, when I work with a lot of organizations, the data and tech people who knew, know about technology sit in the operations team. And so it's kind of separated from the people who are doing work on the ground and how do you build those skills across the organization. So it's not just seen as a monitoring and evaluation or an operations function. Um, we talked about the need to do needs assessments when we go into, when we're working with organizations, like understanding what they need and then building data skills from there. Um, so it's not a one size fits all approach to every organization, it's thinking about, okay, the thing that you are most interested in doing is telling a story. So we need to be able to get you to like use data that might exist or to collect your own data, but the thing we need to focus on is how do you present that data to the audience that you want to reach. And again, that doesn't mean making a data visualization. That could mean telling a story using that data over the radio. We're working with people on how do you present the data to the audience that you want to reach. Um, so that goes back to problem definition. Like a lot of people are like, oh, we want to use the data to do this, and it's like, well, data's not gonna solve that problem. <laughs> um, so really getting them to hone in on what is the actual problem you're trying to solve, and you might not need tech skills, you, you need to just go out and talk to people. And we can come later when you get the data that you're talking about. Um, and then again, like we talked a lot about the buddy system of like, it not just being this one tech person, lone tech person within the organization, I think that's been the failure of when we try to embed people and be like, oh, you're, I mean, we've done this with government, we've done this a lot, we embed a new person into an organization and they're supposed to transform this culture and like, that's obviously magical thinking, but it can also be very alienating and the people don't know how to interact with that techie person. So how do you kind of build data, broad-based data skills across the organization basic data skills, and then if there is a need for someone to be more advanced, there's a few kind of deep divers. And so those were some of the things we went over. Thank you for staying a little bit over.